Let's go use a middle dog. Hi guys, it is a lovely moonlit night here in the collapse of everything as the little dog and I count down our final three days at Bugs in a Jar Farm before heading off into points southward, but uh, it is a, where are we? It is a Thursday night, October 26, 2023, and, and guys, uh, as you may be aware, I, uh, <laughs> I got a little carried away in my last, in my last video, that fellow on the other channel that we don't talk about on this family channel tried to wrestle me for that rant, and I said, no, I claim this one. So if you are a big fan of Jessica Wildfire, I hope, uh, <laughs> I, I hope you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater by unsubscribing from uh, this Doomer channel. But now that I got that off my chest, I can get back to my old boring uh, chronicler of the collapse himself. So this was the original uh, chronicle that I was planning to do today before uh, that little uh, whatever that was from Jessica Wildfire across my desk. So now we're going to uh, take a deep breath and get back to the business at hand, which is chronicling the collapse. And this is an excellent, I think, excellent analysis from oilprice.com about peak oil. Now, guys, I'm not that stupid. I understand that oilprice.com is catered toward oil investors. So it's not surprising that this article is showing up simply, no byline, just simply saying editor oilprice.com. I'm not that stupid. I understand that oilprice.com has an agenda, but even so, that does not mean that their agenda is necessarily wrong. Uh, I think this is the best, most reasonable analysis of peak oil demand and uh, where oil drilling and therefore carbon emissions are going uh, on this planet that I might have ever encountered. So uh, I want to thank oilprice.com and Yahoo News for running this piece, which I am going to share with anybody. Uh, the great peak oil debate. You know, what? when I first went down this rabbit hole uh, in about 2008, I was a major peak oil catastrophist. I honestly thought that uh, that we were going to hit peak oil probably about now. I would have to listen to some of my early videos and that global industrial civilization was going to be in full, you know, Mad Max decline by about now. And guess what? Uh, 2023 will have the highest CO2 emissions uh, ever in the history of humanity. And right here in the good old USA, under Joe Biden, as I reported uh, last week, we pumped more oil, more oil out of the ground in the United States last week under Joe Biden than we have ever pumped at any week in history, including under Donald Trump or either one of the Bush boys. Uh, so anyway, I see exactly 
zero evidence anywhere uh, that the demand for oil, at least, is going to peak any time uh, in, in the next 30 years. The question is the supply. But uh, this is take it away. Oilprice.com editor. <clears throat> Big Oil's mega acquisitions raise questions about peak oil demand. Last year, Big Oil annoyed their home governments by raking in billions on the back of soaring oil and gas prices. Those were caused by demand exceeding supply for hydrocarbons. So this almost sounds like any Doomer channel, except, of course, they're talking to uh, people wondering if oil companies are a good place to invest in. The pain, <laughs> the pain was especially great for the Biden administration. Despite its efforts to clip the industry's wings, and, and, and again, so obviously, uh, oilprice.com is still uh, serving up this propaganda that Joe Biden uh, is an enemy of big oil, despite that uh, ridiculous propaganda, uh, <clears throat> despite its efforts to clip the industry's wings, U.S. oil booked all-time high earnings. So not only did it book all-time production, not only are we seeing all-time greenhouse gas emissions, U.S. oil booked all-time high earnings, meaning it is time to be an oil investor. And while most use the money to pay down debt and boost shareholder returns, some set their sights higher and further into the future. <clears throat> Exxon made $56 billion in net earnings last year. This year, it used a sum slightly higher than the 2022 net total to acquire Pioneer Natural Resources, establishing itself now, Exxon, has now established itself as the leader in U.S. shale. Two weeks later, which I reported on uh, yesterday, I believe, two weeks later, Chevron, which had reported a two-fold increase in profits last year, said it would take over Pierre Hess for $53 billion. Who is next? All industry observers seem to agree that the time was ripe for a consolidation wave in U.S. oil. The reasons for this perception included the record profits that everyone made last year, <clears throat> new acreage running out in the shale patch, and limited new discoveries internationally. So you notice they do make a little bit of, of a nod to uh, the, the peak oil uh, crowd, you know, talking about uh, the supply of oil diminishing. But of course, right next to this article, is that they just discovered a new giant oil field off the coast of Guyana with they're claiming 11 billion barrels of oil or something like that. Anyway, so much for limited new discoveries internationally. <clears throat> According to the Financial Times, the two mega mergers that Exxon and Chevron announced in the past couple of weeks have set off what its 
authors called, quote, an arms race, <laughs> an arms race to secure long-term oil and gas asset supply at a time when some clueless morons are predicting a peak for oil demand. Well, obviously, I added in the words clueless moron. You might recognize this quote because I read it yesterday. It might have been the title of my rant. This is uh, Chevron's chief, Mike Worth. Uh, if you missed that rant yesterday, quote, we, meaning oil companies, we live in the real world and have to allocate capital to meet real world demands. Worth uh, said in an interview, adding that demand for oil will continue to grow beyond 2030. Indeed, in its most recent forecast, as I've already talked about here, uh, OPEC said that oil demand will continue expanding until at least 2045. And again, that's not surprising that OPEC uh, would make that prediction, but that doesn't mean the prediction is wrong. I've already had this rant. OPEC said that oil demand will continue expanding until at least 2045, bringing into sharp relief the consistent underinvestment that has been a trend for years in the industry. The calls for that underinvestment is largely pressure from transition proponents, can you say the greenies, that have drawn investors away from oil and gas while those remaining have insisted companies focus on investor returns. But now, I can't imagine reading this on oilprice.com, but now investors are returning to oil and gas and they want some of those returns. For that and to secure the supply of a critical commodity, in a world still very much dependent on it, the oil majors need access to more production assets. In an environment with a shortage of unexplored assets, securing that access is much easier, easier done through acquisitions. <clears throat> It is an arms race. One source involved in merge, mergers and acquisitions activity told the Financial Times, quote, in most sectors, deal one doesn't necessarily lead to deal two and deal three. I believe in this case it will because timing is of the essence and the two largest players have made their moves close quote. In a recent Forbes article, public analyst and energy consultant David Blackman also pointed out the need to secure production for the future as motivation for the mega deals. And it was a long-term need. Uh, Quote, the common thread connecting these deals is majors looking to refill their pipelines to maintain production against a declining asset base. So you see the shadows of peak oil creeping uh, into these stories to refill their pipelines to maintain production against a declining asset base as they in anticipate their legacy businesses staying profitable uh, into the 2030s. That was one of these analysts, Andrew Dittmar. <clears throat> All of this, 
all of this goes against, you know, what is being printed, this propaganda, this greeny propaganda being splashing all over the mainstream media news, I've noticed, this unadulterated horseshit, in my opinion, all of this goes against what the International Energy Agent Agency said a couple of days ago in its latest World Energy Outlook, that oil and gas demand growth will peak, will peak within the next seven years. The head of the IEA had made the prediction in an op-ed uh, for the Financial Times last month. Now that the report is out, so is the official prediction. This is the newest bright, well, it's not a bright green lie. What kind of lie is this? It's, it's not a bright green lie. I guess it's a kind of like a diarrhea brown lie. Uh, the official uh, line now, the official prediction, oil demand will peak before 2030, along with gas and coal demand, as solar and electric vehicles displace millions of barrels in oil demand. The IEA sees a tenfold increase, a tenfold increase in the number of EVs on roads around the world by 2030 and a surge in wind and solar deployments. So by that year, these plus hydropower presumably reach a share of 50% in global electricity generation capacity, which of course means that 50% will still be fossil fuels and the entire energy demand is getting bigger and bigger, so a 50% share in the energy pie in 2030 is a hell of a lot bigger than a 50% share in the energy pie today. This is the, you know, this real brain teaser that people do not get. It is the frying pan and the fire. I'm surprised that oilprice.com didn't uh, get into that, but I guess see, you can't talk about everything in uh, one editorial. <clears throat> so, why are the super majors spending tens of billions of dollars on oil and gas acquisitions. It might be, it just might be because they are aware that the IEA's projections and similar reports coming out of transition advocacy entities do not necessarily reflect reality. Solar power demand in Europe has been on the decline at a time when it seasonally rises. Europe will not hit its 2023 targets for solar or for wind, for that matter, as both industries suffer under the weight of higher costs. I haven't done a rant on that about the absolutely spiraling cost more so uh, in wind energy, uh, that if, if anybody thinks the price of wind energy is going down, especially if they, if they weren't getting all these subsidies, just like big oil is, got a rude uh, surprise for you. Uh, the price of wind energy is going up so much, so fast, that a lot of these uh, big wind uh, energy corporations are scrapping their plans. 
So what's going on with electric vehicles? <clears throat> EV sales are not exactly taking off in the U.S. In the third quarter, total EV sales in the country were a little over 300,000, which Cox Automotive said was a record high. There's just one little bright green lie in the middle of that. All, all car sales, however, were over 3.8 million, making the share of EVs quite modest. Yeah, there were 12 times as many. 12 times as many uh, gas-sucking cars and trucks and SUVs sold in the past three months as Save the Planet electric vehicles for the simple reason that nobody trusts these EVs to get them to where they're going and uh, the price of those damn batteries and insurance and everything that people are figuring out that uh, EVs are a joke. <clears throat> super majors. I love that word, super major. It's all one word. You mean, you know, the giant uh, oil companies rarely make stupid and expensive decisions, especially when these decisions are this expensive. The decisions by Exxon and, and Chevron to grow through acquisitions were made with a view to the realities of energy demand. That is why neither super major went on a shopping spree for EV charger makers or wind turbine developers. No, Exxon bought the leader in the Permian and Chevron took over Exxon's partner in Guyana, perhaps the hottest new oil location with discoveries so far tapping into an estimated 11 billion barrels in reserves. These are not the actions of companies anticipating any sort of peak in oil demand anytime soon. These are the actions of companies that know very well oil will continue to be critical for the world for decades to come. Uh, okay, well, the, the writer's name was Irina Slav, and uh, so, uh, you tell me, uh, is this just propaganda from an oil investor website? Uh, or is this a no shit Sherlock uh, analysis? of at least peak oil demand. I am with oilprice.com and OPEC and the Energy Information Agency, every one of which predicting uh, the demand for oil and other fossil fuels is going nowhere but up, up, up. And this is why there will be more greenhouse gas emissions in 2023 than in any year in history, breaking last year's record. That record will last for one year. And in the year 2024, you will see more greenhouse gas emissions being emitted on this planet than in 2023. So the record that's getting ready uh, to be made will stand for one year, just like 
the all-time record for greenhouse gas emissions lasted last year. Uh, Anywho's, and uh, I just uh, <laughs> real quick, I I, I just. You know, reading uh, all of this, you know, looking at all of this stuff on that damn hurricane in Acapulco, I guess uh, Paul Beckwith, you can go over to his channel and, and uh, listen more to that hurricane coverage. Uh, they, they, were, they were interviewing this, uh, this one person who was almost killed uh, by this hurricane. They were down in Acapulco on a mining convention. You know, uh, you just got to love karma. Got to love karma. And we're going to see the karma uh, from this. Anyway, I've got to wrap this up and uh, figure out how to burn some more fossil fuels while I still can, my guys. Right, bring on the fossil fuels. Bye, guys.